Great. And Henry, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, adaptive optics, it's really become, uh, like Mike was saying, a, a tool in our kit. You, know, you no longer have to be an adaptive optics specialist in order to use adaptive optics. It's just like another camera at most telescopes these days. Great. Okay, I don't know that we have any other questions, so I'm going to ask one final one in a second. I'll remind anybody on the line that uh, if you do wish to ask a question, just press star 1 and be placed into the queue, uh, or you can send a question to webcast at nsf.gov. Uh, but in case we don't have others, just we'll close with this, and that is what are you hoping to see next on Titan? If you're going to focus there, uh, what are you looking for? What's the next focus? Well, we're certainly going to continue to watch Titan. So far, we've only been observing Titan for a relatively short fraction of its year, just one season or so. Titan's year is 30 Earth years long, and we've been observing for the equivalent of January, February, and part of March. So there's an awful lot for us to still learn as we continue to observe Titan over the following coming years. We're going to continue to use multiple telescopes. Um, the IRTF is a very important part of our, our repertoire, as is Gemini, as are some smaller telescopes that we're bringing online. And what we're going to be looking for is to understand how the seasons evolve on Titan. Where do the clouds form as we move into the next season and continue to look for these large events and distinguish the different scenarios by which they may be forming. Great. Mike, did you want to add anything to that? I, I'm, I'm very excited about what Henry said on this very last part. It's is, is not just for understanding the seasonal evolution, which is, which is a great... Um, it, it's, it, it, Titan is a place that's like the Earth and not like the Earth, and we have very few of those. In fact, we only have one other of those in the solar system. Um, and so Titan, uniquely, we get to be able to study something like the Earth that has seasons, that has, uh, has a hydrological cycle. And so trying to understand more how this goes is fantastic. And I am, I am extremely excited to see if we can't figure out why these, um, these large explosions of methane seem to be coming from what it looks like from the surface of Titan, though it may not be, but uh, I want to see if we can wink track those down. So I think that the, uh, the future on Titan is, is quite exciting with the combination of uh, large ground-based telescopes um, and with uh, including the, the Cassini spacecraft going around there. We have, we have a, a lot still more to learn, and I, I think it's, uh, that's going to be fun for the next few years, too. Excellent. Um, we do have one other question from David Foreman. I'm sorry, do you want to jump in there, Henry? Sure, I'll just, I'll just say that in many ways, as Mike was saying there, Titan is the most similar object to Earth, not in the materials there, but in the processes. In the, what we see going on in, in its atmosphere and surface are more similar to Earth than any other planet in our solar system. And like this big event we saw a year ago, every time we start thinking we sort of understand what's going on on Titan right now, that you know, for the last couple of years everything has been sort of predictable, it throws us a curveball and surprises us, and that's a lot of fun that way. Excellent. Great. Uh, we do have another question on the line. Uh, David Perlman's back. Uh, David, can you hear us? Yeah, sure, I can hear you. And uh, this is a question for Mike. Uh, uh, and Mike, you mentioned that you're using adaptive optics to look at satellites of some of the Kuiper Belt objects. Are uh, you uh, training s some telescope, whether it's Gemini or some other, on uh, the objects like Sedna that you were reporting quite a while ago? Yeah, absolutely. So Sedna, um, sadly, turns out not to have any moons, um, oh, which, is, which is really too bad. Um, but we have, with, with adaptive optics, both on, uh, at Gemini and at the, at the Keck Observatory, we've been observing the satellites of, uh, of Haumea. This was the one that was formerly known as Santa, formerly known as 2003 EL61. has two satellites around it. And um, in, in very much the same way, uh, to, to study a system that has two satellites, so satellites are changing so quickly and interacting so quickly, we were having a very difficult time figuring out um, what they were doing. And the, the thing that finally allowed us to, to get a handle on how they were working, it was, again, this sort of observations from, from Gemini Observatory, where you can, you can take 20 minutes today, 20 minutes tomorrow, 20 minutes the next day, and finally start to watch these things over a significant period of time. We've also been observing uh, Dysnomia, the, uh, the satellite around uh, Eris, and, uh, and so it's been, it's been a great ability to be able to do these things from these, these nice telescopes here on the ground. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to go ahead, and seeing that we have no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and remind everybody that this is all embargoed. Um, it will be available for you if you need to use it to file uh, your stories um, right after the call, and I'll give you some information to get that in a second. Um, but this is all embargoed until uh, Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, 
Right now, though, I'll just go ahead and thank our guests for joining us today, uh, Henry Rowe from Lowell Observatory and uh, Mike Brown from Caltech. Um, we'll be in touch with you guys throughout the week. If uh, any of the reporters on the line wish to get in touch with them one-on-one, we can make that uh, very easily done. Um, there's more information out there in the form of press releases. There's one from uh, Gemini, one from Lowell, one from Caltech, one from Hawaii, and we'll actually have one up there shortly as well. Uh, for contact information for all four of the study PIs uh, and the media officers, if you want to get somebody on the ground to go knock on doors, um, and to get visuals and other materials, just give me a call anytime at 703-292-7730, or you can reach me by email at jchamot at nsf.gov. Uh, and then I also want to remind everybody that there's another webcast here tomorrow at 1 o'clock. It is also embargoed, and it is also in regards to this upcoming nature uh, issue. Uh, this one is about increasing hurricane activity. Um, in short, the Atlantic hurricane activity in the past 10 years has been uh, as strong or stronger than at any time in the past 1,500 years, apparently. Uh, and warming ocean temperatures may be the reason why. Uh, you'll just come right back to this website. Your password uh, will be WINDS, W-I-N-D-S, and the uh, username, which will appear first, that's going to be webcast, both lowercase. Uh, and that's all. So, again, uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow, and thank you for joining us. Right now, though, I'll just go ahead and thank our guests for joining us today, uh, Henry Rowe from Lowell Observatory and uh, Mike Brown from Caltech. Uh, 